Hey everyone, I'm Jonathan Kim for What The Flick, and we finally have another interview for you, and it's a good one. This time it's Julian Schnabel, the Oscar-nominated director of films like The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, Basquiat, and Before Night Falls. His latest film is called Miral, which tells the story of four Palestinian women living in Israel over 40 years, from the creation of Israel in 1948 to the Oslo Accords in 1993. The film spends the most time with a teenager named Miral, played by slumdog millionaire's Frida Pinto, as she grows up in East Jerusalem under Israeli occupation during the early 90s. The Intifada, a word which means to stand up straight, has begun, and Miral must decide between violent resistance against Israel or the peaceful route of education advocated by Hind Husseini, played by Hiam Abbas, the matriarch who founded the safe haven orphanage where Miral was raised. The screenplay was written by Rula Jabril, based on her autobiographical book. There was a special screening of Miral at the United Nations, which naturally stirred some controversy as Jewish groups who had not seen the film, like the American Jewish Committee and the Anti-Defamation League, called for the screening to be cancelled since apparently Jabril's life story isn't pro-Israel enough. I had a chance to speak to Schnabel, who himself is Jewish, about his thoughts on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, what it's like making a film in Israel about a Palestinian girl, and the attacks on Miral by Jewish groups. I think it's some pretty interesting stuff, so I hope you enjoy it. So I heard in an interview you said that uh, you didn't know that much about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict kind of before you started making the movie. I was just wondering what were some of the misperceptions that you had had about the conflict that you learned more about uh, as you were making the film? Well, I think the thing that I knew and didn't know or had a feeling about was how controversial it would be to make a movie about Palestinian people. Because it seems like you can make a movie about anybody but them. And that seemed to be the reason why I made it. And then obviously in doing that and spending time in Palestine, in Israel, you're like a detective. You come across things, you see the way people feel about what you're doing in real life. How they react, what they resist. Um, how difficult it is to surmount certain biases. We were in an area where, where there was a location I liked and there was a man who was a lawyer for the Vatican, uh, uh, for the church in Jerusalem and he also represented some of uh, the Armenian church and, and showed me a couple of locations and I asked uh, Israeli location manager if he would speak English in this particular area uh, and he didn't and he was speaking Hebrew with the people from this school where we wanted to shoot and there was a man who was a Syrian uh, priest he was uh, the um, advisor to uh, the man who is the Armenian uh, was the uh, head of the Armenian sector where this building was. And when that man heard the location manager and everybody speaking Hebrew, we lost that location. So I asked the crew to speak English in certain areas, not because I was I didn't want them to speak Hebrew. I had anything again. I, we needed cooperation from people that were. Uh, Israeli and people that were uh, Palestinians and people that were Muslims or people that were Christians and people that were Jewish and um, and uh, so we lost that location and there was another location that this again the, the the location manager was unable to get and and Rula spoke to the patriarch of the Christian uh, the Christian patriarch and he spoke to these nuns that were at this convent and it was a location that was turned down originally and they let us shoot there. So there were prejudices on all sides that we had to circumvent and there was also cooperation and a kind of benevolence that occurred. Uh, I mean I was able to shoot in the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The mayor of Jerusalem gave us permission to shoot in, in, and we closed the Bob spot, which is where the Lion's Gate is on the way to the Muslim cemetery. Uh, we were able to shoot in the middle of the Villa, uh, Villa de, de la Rosa. 
It's very crowded there. There's a lot of people, a lot of tourists, a lot of all sorts of people, Greek Orthodox priests and, and people from the mosque. And, and there was all sorts of, you know, and, and, and vendors yelling, because the little girl was crying, telling me I should feed the little girl. And you wonder, why am I here with all of these crazy people screaming at me? And it doesn't stop either. I mean, there's, a, I think it was a great opportunity, peacemaking gesture of openness to dialogue to show the movie at the United Nations. At the same time, you got a group of people saying, don't show this movie there. And then you have other people saying, uh, or being in support of that. And so all of these kinds of, uh, uh, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing. What's the problem? So I mean, what do you think is the effect on the discussion of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict where anything that you say that seems like it could be possibly construed as being critical of, uh, of actions of the Israeli government or tactics that they use, uh, anything like that can be considered anti-Semitic or anti-Israel or anti-Zionist. Whereas anything that attempts to show the Palestinian side or help under, people understand what's going on in Palestine is also considered anti-Israel and even anti-Semitic. Uh, what effect do you think that has on the discussion? There's a, uh, there was an article in the Jewish Journal by a woman named Dan Danielle Barron. I just read it the other day. It's very, it's fantastic. And she's explaining that, you know, there, that for me to tell this story is as if I would be, people could conceive that as me betraying my tribe. I mean, we're making all of these movies, or there have been movies about Vietnam or about a million different problems. But I, I mean, it's amazing how we could kind of examine ourselves or show that there was some kind of injustice that occurred without being seen as anti American. The whole point is that we don't have to look at this and think, oh, we need to represent our people here. You need to see the eye in that girl. And just, it's a story about her. It's just a story about this girl. And it's amazing that, and nothing much happens. But it does say that these people have been born into a situation that they did not uh, design. I'm not saying that Palestinians haven't been part of the designing of this situation, but this particular girl is just, and these other women are the recipient of decisions that have been made by men, mostly. And, uh, and they're usually the biggest casualties in war. And so the idea that Hindu Saini started this school to protect these kids, why in the world would that be anti-Israeli? It's absurd. And so, or me telling the story of Hind and of a girl who basically, through love and education, decides that she'll write about what happened rather than blowing herself up or shooting somebody, seems to be a positive thing rather than a negative thing. It's all, it's for the mental health of everybody. I mean, we need to be open. We need to listen to the, the, we need to listen to the other side, like I said, or there's no dialogue. What is this, this country, this country that we, we're so, is supposed to be a democracy? And, and, and Israel is supposed to be a democracy. And it has to be. And I think we need to be more democratic. We need to listen to other voices. And we also need to put some pressure on the Israelis to be more democratic. And you know what? I think that many of, many of them are. I'm, when I say Israelis, it's like saying Americans. I mean, there's diff all different kinds of Americans, I mean, and, and, and that have many different beliefs. And I think that it's a mistake to, to call all Palestinians Palestinians, or Israelis Israelis, or Americans. And I think that the whole point of the movie was about 
one person. It wasn't the story of everybody. It was about one girl. It was about her family. It was about her experience. Uh, and the experience of members of her family. And it was her, like a diary. So when somebody says, oh, you could have made it tougher, or why don't you show this other side? It's one side. It's her story. It's as simple as that. And why in the world couldn't you tell that story? I don't get it. Uh, I understand the fear and the complaints and all of the, not the insanity and the, the yelling and the whatever, but the idea of making a movie is to communicate something. I think all of my films have been about people trying to communicate something and having an obstacle that's stopping them, whether it's society, whether it's the art world, whether it's the Cuban Revolution, whether it's prejudice against homosexuality, whether it's somebody that's stuck inside their body and the limits of preconceptions about sickness and about uh, that we just usually see the people's malady instead of seeing what's going on beyond that. All revelations in some way to me uh, and learning process about what it is to be a human being uh, and uh, trying in each case to I guess use whatever my perspective is or my vantage point but to apply it to different uh, human configurations. I mean if you look at my paintings they many of them have different appearances but the approach is the same. So is it, it's maybe the same thing in different forms, but rather than just doing something that has the same appearance all the time, it's interesting for me or compelling for me to uh, try to do something that I haven't done before. So I thought it was very important to, for me to tell a, a story from the point of view of a 16-year-old Palestinian girl as a 59-year-old Jewish guy. It's funny to say I'm 59, that's like a joke. I'm basically six years old.